So um, let's take a look then at a couple of quick things. Um, we know that novices rely very heavily on their background knowledge and context. And so it's best if they can have opportunities to build that knowledge and to anticipate what's coming next. We know that at the intermediate level, some of the things that break down or that keep them from progressing are that they don't necessarily catch details or that they don't have a good command of language structures that indicate sequence, time frame, and chronology. So those are some of the kinds of things we'll want to scaffold at that level in order to help them move to the advanced level. At the advanced level, some of the things that they um, are challenged by tend to be abstract issues. And so we want to use context and conventions of the language, or they tend to use context and the conventions of the language to compensate. Um, and we want to help them move from concrete to abstract conversations. So an example of that would be instead of just letting them summarize a particular text, I might have them summarize two or three texts about whatever it is that we're studying or exploring. And then I might ask them to make some generalizations about those texts where they're having to kind of pull from two or three texts to make a more abstract statement about the concrete individual details um, in the text. That is a synthesis kind of an activity, and it's one that is very difficult um, and that they need a lot of practice with. And then at the superior level, one of the major things that keeps them from progressing is the idea that if there are lots of cultural references and cultural assumptions embedded in the text, um, they may have difficulty with those. And so I might want to provide some additional support regarding those kinds of references. Let's see here. Um, so now we're going to take a look at specific strategies for addressing each of these issues. Um, purposes for reading, we've already kind of talked about. We want to help guide learners' attention to what exactly it is they're supposed to be doing with the text. What are you supposed to be finding out as you read or engage with the text? And how is it that you're going to do that? And so I can scaffold that in terms of processes like the various ways that we read. I can scaffold that in terms of providing worksheets or graphic organizers that students have to complete as part of their reading, um, and so forth. I want to help them activate their prior knowledge. So this happens to be a fake text, but it will give you an idea of how you might um, go about this. So I might ask students to use their knowledge of, of the genre of newspapers um, or their knowledge of some of the key words to figure out what this seems to be about. Um, and between cognates and um, just the general structure of a newspaper that most students are familiar with, they can usually figure out that there's something about a little girl, there's a story about an ogre, there's a story about a heroine, um, a little girl's disappeared, so on and so forth. So then you can start to ask students to make predictions. Well. What do you think uh, this story is going to be about? Or how do you think that um, these events might be related? Um, we want to develop understanding from concrete to abstract. So as I mentioned before, giving learners opportunities to have experiences with whatever it is we're going to have them do before they actually have to work through the principles or read about uh, the ideas in an abstract way, even if it's a very small mini experience. Um, and that might take the form of an experiment or of a simulation. It could be some sort of hands-on thing that they're going to participate in. It could be a field trip. It could be even a video clip. But we want to create some sort of shared concrete activity or experience first. Attending to genre is huge for a lot of um, language learners. Genre is something that occurs within a culture and it's used for specific social purpose. It generally follows a particular overall organizational structure and it contains specific linguistic features. So if we think about a newscast, the social purpose is to convey information. We know that the general organizational structure is that we're going to have kind of a 
main highlights, the most important news at the beginning of the program. Um, at some point, we're going to talk about the weather. At some point, we're going to talk about sports. At some point, we're going to talk about local community events. Um, and there will be ads mixed in through the, through the um, newscast. And so, uh, and they're going to use certain kinds of language. Um, we might hear more of the passive voice. We might hear more of the who, what, when, why, how kind of reporting, for example. And so knowing how that genre works can position students to be able to access it when they're reading it or listening to it. Um, it doesn't take, even if you don't speak Russian and can't read Russian, you can probably make some pretty strong predictions about what this is. Um, obviously a weather map. Uh, you can guess that we've probably got high and low temperatures, and you can guess that these are probably names of cities or names of geographical um, features like names of oceans and things like that, um, just from your prior experience with the genre. We talked about the importance of multiple representations and so we don't want to give students just a single text to work with, but we might have them look at other texts that are also related to the weather <clears throat> and see if they can figure out what these texts are saying. Um, in this case, you have months of the year, for example. Here's another one, uh, a different representation with different types of information. And you'll notice the little legend in the lower right-hand corner and yet another representation. And so by working with multiple representations, students have the chance to use the same language over and over again for different purposes. If we look at the idea of fairy tales, fairy tales, at least in the United States, have a particular structure um, that applies to the genre. Most of them begin with once upon a time and most of them end with and they all lived happily ever after. Generally, there is some kind of good character or characters and a set of bad characters. There's usually a set of events that happens and it tends to be repetitive. So we have three little pigs, each one wants to build a house, and we go through that event three times. The first time he builds it out of sticks, the second time he builds it out of um, stones, I think. I can't. Oh no, out of straw, the second time out of sticks, and the third time out of bricks. Um, and each time there's a little twist. You know, the wolf comes and he tries to blow the house down and the pig somehow manages to escape. And then it builds and builds until finally we have the climax of the story, which ends in some sort of moral lesson. That same structure also occurs in The Three Billy Goats Gruff, in Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and other kinds of similar fairy tales. So once a student understands the structure, then it's much easier for them to process the text. So here's an example for you. Um, I know some of you speak this language, but many of you don't. Uh, and so if you look at this, can you guess what it is? What kind of a text is this? How do you know? And I'm sure you've probably quickly figured out it's a newspaper. And I'll bet, even though you may not speak the language at all, you or read the language, you can probably identify the date. You can probably pick out some headlines. You could probably identify where the captions are. And if you have a little bit of experience with the language, you might even be able to pick out some of the characters that you know. Um, you could also probably make predictions about what's going on in this story based on the pictures. That is an example of why genre is so important. If I were to take the text and put it on a plain sheet of paper and remove it from its original context, I would dramatically increase your difficulty in being able to read that text. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that culturally authentic materials are so important. It's also important to note that genre varies from language to language. So some of those genre conventions will be different depending on the language and culture of, um, you know, that you happen to be exploring. Here's another example in Spanish. Um, the date is clearly identifiable. We can find, you know, key big ideas and we can find important details in the text. And I can use technological tools to scaffold this for students. So I could take a screenshot of this image 
and upload it into a tool like Prezi, which is a presentation tool. And one of the interesting things that Prezi does is it allows you to focus in and then to zoom back out. So it leaves the whole context there, but you can focus in on a particular part. So instead of just circling things, I could progressively sequence the order that I want students to read this article. So maybe I want them to read the, the paragraph that's circled first, and then I want to zoom out. And then maybe I want them to look at a different section second, because I know that that will make it more accessible than if they were to read the whole article in order. Um, so that would be another example of how you might scaffold a text. You can also annotate text using tools like ThingLink, which if we have time, we'll talk about later. So genre awareness helps our learners predict what's going to happen in the text, understand what's in the text, and also it sets them up to be able to produce text when we get to the presentational phase. Um, because if they understand the genre, they've already got some key structures in place that they can build the rest of their text around. Academic language is kind of a tricky thing for um, a lot of students. When we think of academic language, a lot of us think of taking an article and picking out all of the technical terms in the article. So we might take, um, or in the video clip or whatever. So if it's an article about um, the environment, we might you know, pick out terms like greenhouse gases or um, climate change or things like that. And what we may not realize is that what academic language actually is are the words, the grammar, the organizational strategies, the thinking processes, and the abstract concepts that go into making a text, um, particularly one that is used in an academic context. And so um, the specific implication here for language teachers and language learners is if we as language teachers will focus on, um, as we're preparing what vocabulary we might want to introduce or to teach, we tend to go through the article and pick out all the words we think students won't know. It would be more advantageous to our students to go through the text and say, as I look through this text, what are some of the words that I see that are likely to reappear in other texts? So words like rotate, develop, um, organize, um, and I happen to name all verbs. They aren't all necessarily verbs, but some of those transitional words and phrases. If we were to pick those out and teach those, then when a student moves from one text to the other, they are progressively acquiring the language they need to read larger and larger bodies of material across a variety of different content areas. If we focus only on the field-specific language, so for example, if I'm having students read something that has mathematical content, and I only focus on words that don't um, transfer to other things, so for example, parallel is a word that has a mathematical meaning, but it's also a word that we use in lots of other ways. Um, his thinking was not parallel to hers. They parallel part. Um, we use parallel in a lot of different contexts. And so once a student understands what parallel means, they can understand that word in a variety of contexts. Whereas if we focus on something really, really specific, like um, hypotenuse, for example, the hypotenuse of a triangle, um, then we are, I hate to say wasting our time, but we are putting students in a position where we're making them focus their attention on something that may not be useful to them outside of that particular piece of text. And so we want to look for words that transfer is the idea here. And those are the words that we want to emphasize and help students recycle. Um, I think we mentioned this in another webinar, but the idea of the transitional words and helping them to understand that transitional words have different purposes. So uh, this happens to be in Spanish, but the first column are all different ways to signal that I want to add information. So words like additionally, um, in reality, nevertheless, for example, also, those are words that I might include before I add some additional information. Words for comparison, like um, equally 
or in the same way, um, on the other hand, things that help us to compare, you know, of equal importance, words that help me to conclude. In conclusion, in summary, in synthesis, finally, um, lastly, so we want to give them words for different purposes, and we wouldn't want to give them a list this large, but slowly introducing those so that they become progressively more able to actually signal relationships in the ideas that they want to share and to understand relationships between ideas in the text that they are listening to, reading, or watching. So that's kind of a quick summary of some basic strategies. Now let's take a look at the content issues. So one of the other problems for our readers is that even if they have great language skills, if they don't know anything about the content, they're going to have difficulty following what it is that we're doing with them. And so this happens to be um, a list of different ways that we can help learners, and we're going to quickly move through some of these and through some examples. So I want to activate learners' prior knowledge and experiences. And all you have to do is Google that, and there are millions of strategies that come up. But the idea here is we want them to remember things that have happened to them. We want them to think about their own experiences and analyze it in order to come up with ideas or specific um, pieces or, or key principles that they can apply to their project. We want them to evaluate things if it worked well or didn't work well. Um, and we want to have them have opportunities to apply things. And we're going to look at a couple of textual examples in just a second. We want to build their background knowledge. So it's not just a question of activating what they already know, but if I'm working with urban public um, students in an urban public area, university, um, who may not do a lot of traveling, and I'm talking with them about things from a completely different culture or a completely different climate, um, for example, if I live in Kansas and I'm trying to get them to understand things about Alaska, I might need to build some of their background knowledge about Alaska in order for them to actually understand text that will allow us to complete our project with the school in Alaska. Um, conceptual understanding. So, for example, if we're doing a project related to freedom, I might want to have them reading, listening to, or viewing things related to different perspectives on freedom and what that means and how we define it. Um, that could consist of things like surveys or magazine quizzes. It could consist of journal entries where I say, tell me about a time when you didn't feel, uh, when you felt like you were being controlled by someone or some, some particular situation. How did that make you feel? Um, what are some of the you know, strategies that, or things that interfere with your ability to do what you want to do? What are some strategies you use to, you know, be able to gain more freedom in your life? And so we can talk about freedom in different contexts so that then as students pursue, um, you know, whether it's maybe they're giving a speech on freedom or whatever the project might entail, that they have the conceptual understanding to accomplish that. So, here is a potential example. Let's say that our students are working to uh, on projects um, related to blindness in the target language. Uh, this particular article is an article about a do-it-yourself braille printer that this boy that you see in the picture made out of Legos. The article talks about the fact that braille printers are generally extremely expensive and that means that most people who are blind can't afford them. And this boy heard about that and created this printer out of Legos for a fraction of the cost of what the typical ones um, generally sell for. So what would learners need to understand about blindness and in order to understand this article, for example? Those kinds of things might be scaffolding that I might put in place. So before they read this article, I might have them read um, an infographic with statistics on blindness. I might have them look at an, uh, some kind of magazine article or public service announcement that talks about some of the challenges that people face who are blind um, and some of the needs that they have. 
I might have them compare and contrast how difficult, you know, I might give them a personal experience where um, I have them interact with uh, or try to complete tasks without being able to see what it is that they're doing and then draw some conclusions about what that might mean. Um, as a result, that might position students to better be able to understand the content of the article. And then an understanding of the field um, and of the culture that we're working with. So if we're doing a project with a secondary school in Bangladesh, what are some of the cultural understandings my students might need in order to be able to complete the project? And I need to think about those and explicitly build those in um, to my instructional plan or my project plan. Um, so by giving students opportunities to interact with the content of the text, to make personal connections to their own experiences, between their experiences and the text, and helping them to see relationships between ideas, I can dramatically position them to have more success with the text. So let's look at what that would look like. So let's say that we're doing a project related to friendship maybe with a sister city in another country. So in order to build conceptual understanding, I might use an infographic like this. This infographic, um, for those of you who don't read Spanish, talks a little bit about the origins of the word friendship. It talks about uh, surveys and what people think friendship is based on. Is it based on trust or is it based on support? Um, how many people are satisfied in their friendships um, and what their closest ties are. Um, it talks about qualities over in the right-hand side uh, in the gray box. It talks about the most sought-after qualities in a friend. So this would be great for working with um, adjectives and personality descriptions, for example. Um, and then at the bottom, it talks about friendship as it is explained um, by various other sources, such as the Bible or philosophers like Aristotle. So this one little infographic gives us lots of basic information in ways that are very accessible because of the pictures and the language that are used. And I can use this as a springboard then to scaffolding communication for students to talk about, well, what, are, what qualities do you care about in a friend? Let's take a little quiz and see. Um, here's a list of things maybe that I'm drawing out of their textbook or whatever that might be part of um, this project. Um, and I can get them to start stating opinions and expressing opinions in very basic ways regarding friendship. So, and I might even have them read, you know, examples of magazine stories where somebody was a really good friend or where somebody wasn't a really good friend um, and let them evaluate that or talk about that in preparation for um, them thinking about cultural comparisons. How does the idea of friendship here in the United States differ from uh, the idea of friendship in the country where we might be doing our collaboration? Um, and so then they might interview their partner uh, school um, in order to gain more information. And so this launches or begins the inquiry into friendship as it builds background knowledge and schema for that so that they have things to think about as they work through that. Here's another example. Um, this headline says, uh, I served the masculine ego for my progress. And so this might be good, a good article to use for um, a unit that's talking about women's issues, for example, a, a project where we're, we're um, engaging in that. Conceptual schema, so giving students opportunities to diagram. This is great for novices in particular, you can use it at all levels, but particularly for novices because we're only asking them to produce one word at a time. And if we think about the novice level, the language that they can produce generally comes in the form of labels, lists, um, formulaic expressions, things like that. So this is an opportunity for me to build background knowledge and to also build academic language because if they give me, so for example, I observed a lesson um, by a student teacher where students, novice level students were asked to talk about um, homelessness and street children, children who lived on the street in another country. And students were asked as part of the conceptual background building to watch some videos and engage with some texts and then to, to produce 
a concept map that talked about or showed the problems that children, street children face. And so a lot of their examples were things like no tiene dinero or no tienen dinero. They don't have money. They don't have parents. They don't have health care. And as the teacher, as I'm putting these things on the board after they've generated their concept maps in pairs and they're calling these things out for the shared concept map, I can add academic language to that. So when they say no tiene dinero, I can say, oh yes, la pobreza, poverty. You know, they experience poverty. Um, or I can um, talk about, you know, the fact that they don't have parents, they are orphans. So I can start to provide that additional language for them. This is just another example of a concept map where they are brainstorming everything they can think about um, related to the topic. <clears throat> and so they could do that in advance of studying or exploring something. You can have them create process maps. What process, for example, with the friendship example, I could say, well, how does a person become friends? You know, draw the process for me with you and a partner and let, let's see if we can figure this out. Um, based on your own experiences and the things you've read and so on and so forth. Okay, now on the outside of that process, can you draw factors that might interfere with a friendship? We can connect students to experts. So this would be an opportunity for them to interview experts or to communicate with experts in writing or using Google Hangouts um, to gain more information about whatever it is that they're interested in. They can generate a list of their own questions. Um, <clears throat> We can use, that's another example of a concept map, we can focus on big ideas, um, helping them to see the overall before we move down to the, the nitty gritty, nitpicky things about um, the project. And the idea of multiple representations we already talked about. We want to use high interest readings. This is another place where reading breaks down or uh, listening or viewing because as teachers we tend to think about what information we want students to acquire and we're not thinking about whether or not it's something that students would actually care about. Um, one great test for this is what I call the Facebook test. So if I were to have that particular article or video clip or text come through your Facebook feed, would what you see make you want to click on it? If you clicked on it, would it challenge you to think something new? Would it make you feel something, some kind of generate some kind of an emotional response? Would it help you solve a problem? Would it help you see life in a new way? And the most important piece, would you want to make this a part of who you are and how you think about the world? As we select text, for our students to engage with around our topics in preparation for their inquiry um, and their project completion, we really want to think about those things. Because the more interesting the text is, the more students will persevere through difficulty in order to be able to decode and understand what it means. So if we have to summarize, we want to activate their prior knowledge and experiences. We want to build conceptual understanding. When we connect learners to cultures, content from other disciplines, and communities, we make texts more comprehensible and meaningful because we give them personal experience, we build schema that way, and um, it sets them up to have more context for what they're reading. We want to develop interactive things they can do with the text before they read, while they read, and after they read. And we want to engage them with meaning.